I've always found it fascinating to look at epitaphs on tombstones. Maybe our family's at a memorial service and we have a little extra time and I wander around. Um, uh, there's one that uh, is on uh, William Shakespeare's tombstone. It's written, he was not of an age, but for all time. Uh, written of a scientist who died at age 65, it re reads, he died learning. Uh, there's some humorous epitaphs too. One reads, all dressed up and no place to go. A tombstone outside Wichita reads, I told you I was sick. Can't you just hear him? Another person wrote, I remember, friend, when passing by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you will be. Prepare for death and follow me. To which someone later added, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. <laughs> the epitaph to me that is most inspiring of all is found in the Bible. It's a tribute to King David. Acts 13, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Uh, God declares his approval of David's life and his heart. It's puzzling because David was a warrior who shed much blood. He committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. And after she became pregnant, to cover it up, he murdered her husband, Uriah. He was negligent as a father. And it caused his family to be plagued with strife and tragedy. Contrary to the Lord's command, David pridefully numbered his troops. And it caused 70,000 people to die in a plague. How can a man with this many missteps be called a man after God's heart? You, you, you read David's life and you think, no way. If you've done things you're not proud of, you feel trapped in some dark sin, or maybe you've never committed your life to Christ, this is encouraging because this tells you that God forgives. God is rich in mercy. Even though you have a checkered past, you can become a person after God's heart. Here's what we learn. God doesn't just look at what you've done. He looks at your heart. Now, when we talk about the heart in the Bible, he's not talking about the, the muscle that pumps blood. He's talking about the inner thoughts, the mind, our desires, our will, our emotions. David was a man of glorious triumphs, yet great tragedy. Uniquely gifted, but human to the core. Strong in battle, but weak at home. Why are we beginning a study of his life? Because David isn't some polished marble personality. He is blood and bone and breath sharing our struggles of spirit and soul. 1809 was a very good year. Not that anybody noticed. Every eye in Europe was on Napoleon as he was uh, going through Austria like a wildfire through a parched forest. Napoleon's name was synonymous with military superiority and ruthless ambition. All eyes were on him, but that same year, babies were being born in England and the United States. Alfred Tennyson was born in Lincolnshire. William Gladstone was born in Liverpool. Oliver Wendell Holmes was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and nearby in Boston, Edgar Allan Poe drew his first breath. And in a little log cabin in Hodgenville, Kentucky, a cabin owned by an illiterate laborer and his wife, the first tiny screams were heard of Abraham Lincoln. All this happened in 1809, but nobody noticed. The destiny of the world was taking place in Austria, right? Or was it? 
the nobodies, nobody noticed, were being born statesmen, thinkers, writers that would dent the destiny of this world. The year 1020 B.C. was also a very good year, but not because of Saul, the Napoleon of his day. Saul, the king of Israel, had shown himself not to be a man after God's heart. Rashness, compromise, disobedience against God had tarnished his character. And finally, Samuel, the prophet, came to him and says, God has rejected you as king, and he's chosen someone else to replace you. That year was especially significant because while everyone was watching the reign of Saul sink, in a secluded field in Bethlehem, God was raising up a youth named David, a nobody who would change the course of, of Israel. If you'd like to read with me our text today, it's 1 Samuel 16, 1. Uh, if you want to use our Bibles, I forgot to look up the page number. It's about a third of the way into the Bible. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. He dispatches Samuel to Red Eye, Minnesota. No, not exactly. He sends him to John Day, Oregon. No, not that either. He sends him on a bus uh, to Muleshoe, Texas. No, again, I'm kidding. But it might as well have been. Bethlehem was the Red Eye and the John Day and the Muleshoe of that day little tiny town. So Samuel makes plans to go to Bethlehem. But as he walks, his stomach churns and his mind races. It's not smart to anoint a new king when there is a king already on the throne who is suspicious and hostile. But Samuel said, how can I go? He's talking to God. If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. God says, make the plan that you're coming for a sacrifice. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint me, the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled. When they met him, they asked, do you come in peace? Prophets don't, didn't come to Bethlehem. It's just a little no place. Samuel says, no, I come in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Then after the crowd disperses, Samuel gets down to the real purpose of his trip. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, the oldest son of Jesse, and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Uh, the scene has a dog show uh, feel to it. Samuel ex examines the boys one at a time, like canines on leashes, more than once ready to give the, red, the blue ribbon. But God says no. Eliab, the oldest, seems the logical choice. Wavy-haired, strong-jawed, tight blue jeans, <laughs> piano, keyboard smile. Samuel says, no. The Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Abinadab, the second son, enters as contestant number two. You'd think a GQ model had just walked in. An Italian suit, alligator, skin shoes, jet bat, black, oiled back hair. He was, would be a classy king, but God isn't into classy. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Samuel asked for son number three, Shammah. He's bookish, studious. 
He has a degree from State University and has his eye on a postgraduate program in Egypt. Jesse whispers, valedictorian of Bethlehem High. Samuel's impressed. God isn't. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Seven sons pass. Seven sons fail. The procession comes to a halt. Samuel's puzzled. He counts the boys. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jesse, didn't you say you have eight sons? A similar question caused Cinderella's mother to squirm. I imagine Jesse did too. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. He's the youngest brother. He's the little brother, the runt, the hobbit, the baby. We find David out back with the pasture, in the pasture with the flock. The Bible dedicates 66 chapters to his life. More than anyone else in the Bible outside of Jesus Christ. The New Testament mentions his name 59 times. The Son of God will be called the Son of David. The greatest Psalms will flow from his pen. We'll call him king, warrior, giant killer. But today he's not even included in the family meeting. He's just a forgotten, uncredentialed kid performing a menial task in a map dot town. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. What caused God to pick David? What kind of heart did David have that attracted the attention of God? Why David and not Eliab? We want to know. We really want to know. After all, we've walked in David's pasture the pasture of exclusion. We're weary of society's surface level system of being graded according to the inches of our chest, the square footage of our house, the color of our skin, the make of our car, the label of our clothes, the size of our office, the presence of diplomas, the absence of pimples. Don't we weary of such games? Hard work ignored, devotion unrewarded. The boss chooses cleavage over character. The teacher picks pet students instead of prepared ones. Parents show off their favorite sons and leave runts in the field. What stood out in David? I think two things are worth noting. One, we look, God sees God's statement is worth rereading. Would you read it with me? But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Where does the Lord look? At the heart. It's possible to have a towering stature, but a shriveled soul. God saw what no one else saw, a God-seeking heart. David, for all his faults, stayed after God's heart. In the end, that's all God wants or needs. Others look at your wallet, not God. He sees hearts. Give God your heart. Say, God, I'm all yours. Give me a pure heart. A heart that seeks you first. When you do that, you don't have to try to impress anyone. You can just be yourself. 
Starbucks opened some stores in China a few years back. They provided all kinds of teas. On the outside, they made it look like a Chinese tea house. Customers came and they were frustrated. They say, where's my latte like I got in the United States? They wanted Starbucks to be Starbucks. Be yourself. Don't try to be somebody else. Be who God made you. Just see that you give him your whole heart. Behind every great story, there's always another story. Rarely does success come without time, discipline, and hard work. What many people don't realize is that it's the things no one sees that result in the things everyone wants. It's the faithfulness to do mundane things well, to develop productive habits, to remain faithful that eventually leads to success. When David was tending the sheep by day and watching over the flock by night, he developed a heart for God. He learned to depend on God. He learned to pray to God about everything. He learned to praise God even in difficult situations. He treasured God's word. How do we know this? We know this from the 75 Psalms he wrote. Read this divine commentary on why David was chosen. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. David went about his job of shepherding sheep with integrity. David was simply promoted from one kind of shepherding sheep to another kind, people. He took what he learned from shepherding sheep and goats to leading people. If David could be trusted with the flock, God could trust him with his people. Out in the wild, David was willing to risk his life to protect the sheep. David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. I certainly wouldn't take on a lion or a bear to protect a sheep. But David did. He learned dependence on God's strength and cared about every sheep. It's encouraging to know that God doesn't just look at what we've done, but he looks at our heart. The second thing I think we should note is we forget God remembers. Jesse was told to bring his sons to the sacrifice, for one of them would be anointed king. When Samuel had examined them all, he asked Jesse if he had another son. Jesse's, oh yeah, I almost forgot answer, reveals that David had been overlooked. We get the impression that he had forgotten he had another son. Perhaps he did not have high hopes for David. Jesse's attitude toward David displays a mistake parents often make with their kids. He didn't appreciate all of his children equally. Jesse never intended to whistle David in from the fields. He didn't value him. Parents, the greatest contribution you can make to your child is not only introducing him or her to Christ, but to giving them a high sense of value and worth. They need to know that they have a unique ability and something unique to offer like every other member of the family. Do you communicate to your children that they might be someone that God's going to use in an amazing way? Or do you play favorites, keeping others out in the field with the flock? This was not, probably not the first time David had been forgotten, excluded from a family gathering. He'd grown accustomed to being re relegated to the sheep <coughs> while his brothers embarked on an adventure. Jesse may have forgotten, but God remembered. He told Samuel to anoint the nobody. Nobody noticed. 
to be the next king of Israel. If I asked you to tell your story, what would you tell me? If I asked you to tell me, what are some ways God has remembered me and used me? What would you say? You might tell me where you were born, how you were raised. You might tell me about a time you made a winning basket. Or you threw up before your first solo. If you're married, you might tell me how you met your spouse. If you're single, you might tell me about your best friend. If you're a parent, you might take out your phone and show me photos of your kids. In all the cases, you would be telling me a way that God remembered you and used you. Let me tell you a little bit about my story. When I was a junior, I probably told this story before at different times. It's, it's just part of who I am. I was the Young Life leader at Beaverton High School. And one of the girls who attended that club's father was the pastor of Valley Community Presbyterian Church. She came home, she says, Dad, you've got to hire Ron Kincaid. So her dad came to the club and heard me talk, and, and he did hire me to oversee the middle school, high school, and college summer programs at their church. Let me tell you, that year was an amazing year. I would not exaggerate if I said over 100 kids gave their lives to Christ. It was like a revolution going on in Beaverton and in that church. And at the end of that summer, I said, you know, I think I might want to be a pastor. This may be what I was born for. And so I made plans to attend Trinity University Seminary in Chicago. I led a Young Life Club back there as well. In that club, I'd say even more amazing things happened. And the club grew like from 20 to 200 in one year. And we had like 11 leaders and they were all mostly from the seminary. And I called Young Life and I says, I need a head girl leader. So they sent out Jory to one of my leaders meeting. When she came up the stairs, I said, wow, Young Life's really doing a job here. She was beautiful and I thought, wow. And so we did our leaders meeting and at the end I said, well, let's get in the living room and let's pray. And I had us all sit Indian leg style and I made sure I got next to Jory and uh, as we started to pray, my knee touched hers. I was putting the moves on. She didn't know it, but... Uh, <laughs> And then I said, uh, let's hold hands. <laughs> I mean, you know, God hears you better when you hold hands, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't remember a thing about anybody prayed that night, but I remember my knee and my hand. <laughs> and so we started to date as we worked together in Young Life. But that's just my side of the story. Her side is even more interesting. She got married young, midway through college. And a few months after they were married, her husband was diagnosed with inoperable spinal cancer. And they pleaded with God, please save him. But he went down quickly. So there she was, a young gal, a widow. Hardly anybody's a widow at that age. Her life had just gotten blown up. She says, God, what do you want me to do? So she thought she would volunteer in some ministry. She tried Campus Crusade. She called Young Life. She says, need any girl leaders? And they sent her to my club. About a year into our dating, she said to me, I don't think you would have been interested, at, interested in me in high school or my first two years of college. A bouncy, blonde, cheerleader. But when Paul died, I grew deeper stronger, more mature. And God brought us together and together we've been able to do far more than we could have done apart. So he takes a gal living in Chicago, a guy that grew up in San Francisco, came to Portland, back to Chicago and brings us together. If you're looking for someone, believe me, God knows how to do that. I brought a picture of her. So this is how we ended it that fall or that next year. Look at that, huh? Finally got her. Look real close. Do you see those mean chops on that hunk? <laughs> Man, I was something. 
God saw each of us and he saw our hearts that our primary purpose in life was to serve him. And he brought us together, brought us someone to do it with. The story of young David assures us the same thing. God looks at your heart. Maybe you'd like to give God your heart this morning. You say, God, I want you in my life. I believe in your son. Come in and forgive my sin. Or you say, God, I want to make you first place in my life this year. You've given your life to Christ before, but you haven't given him your whole heart. Give him your whole heart today. Your father knows your heart. And because he does, he can do great things through you this year. Father, we thank you for the story of David. He's encouraging because he made a lot of mistakes and we've made a lot of stupid decisions. And sometimes we feel like after what we've done, you can't use us. But David shows us you can if we give you our heart and make you first place in our lives. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now as we begin this new year. Tell God, God, you want to make him first place in your life. You want to give him your whole heart. No more lukewarm. No more half-hearted. Your whole heart this year. Or maybe you've never given your life to Christ. You could do it right now. Start this year and say, Christ, I believe you're the son of God and we were raised from the dead. Would you come in and make me a new person? Everybody pray. I'll give you about a minute. Thank you, Lord, that you look at our hearts. Sometimes what we have on the outside doesn't, doesn't appear like much, but you see what our desires are, and you can do so much with that. And so we offer them to you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.